Welcome again. Oscilloscopes, or simply referred to as COPES, are electronic instruments that can be used for observing and capturing time-varying voltage signals. As of their flexibility, they play a very important role in electronic engineering laboratories. However, especially for unexperienced users and beginners, the broad range uh, of functions that some scopes offer might be very confusing. And therefore, let us talk about the very basics of oscilloscopes. So maybe you have already seen this scope in the intro of our previous videos. You can see it might not be the most modern one, but nevertheless the basic functions that we will concentrate on in this tutorial are available on every scope. A scope can generally be used to capture the waveform of a given voltage signal that will most probably vary over time. Therefore, the usual output we get on a scope screen is a plot of voltage over time. This signal could be a sinus, a triangle or any other arbitrary voltage signal. In this way, a scope can be used for a broad range of applications. Usually, the waveform is captured over a defined time before and after a trigger event. In this tutorial, we will concentrate on a keysight scope that is also used in our lab exercises. Let us therefore have a look at some basic controls and boards. The most important ones are the analog input channels, the knobs for scaling vertical and horizontal axes, the knobs for setting the offset of vertical and horizontal axes, the buttons for enabling and disabling the channels and as you see channel 1 is enabled and the trigger setting panel. I will explain all of these in detail in the course of the video. Let us now continue by showing you a simple example. Our test setup only consists of a signal generator and the scope itself and these are connected by simple coaxial cables. The signal generator is set to generate a sine signal with an amplitude of 2 volt peak peak and a frequency of 1 kHz. In the beginning we just see a straight line as the signal generator output is not activated yet. If we now enable the output of the signal generator we see the expected sine wave. As our scope has two analog channels, we would also like to use the second one. And therefore, we set up a triangular signal with a peak to peak voltage of 1 volt, the same frequency, and a phase shift of 180 degrees. Now, again, enabling the signal generator output and also channel 2 on our scope, we see both signals. And in order to make the signal's faces fit our settings, the faces have to be aligned too. Obviously, the periods or the frequencies are equal and the signal peaks differ by a factor of two. The channels can also be disabled and enabled by pushing the according channel buttons. This comes in handy especially for scopes with even more channels. Before, we have compared the two signals with respect to period and the relative amplitude. But now the question arises, how could we obtain and measure absolute values from the plot? Having a look at the screen, we see a grid that is dividing the screen into so-called divisions. Furthermore, the scope provides scale factors that define the volts per division for each channel and the seconds per division respectively. And in our case, the channels are both at 500 millivolts per division and the time scale is at 200 microseconds per division. In this way, the peak to peak voltages 
as well as the period can be calculated by counting the divisions. In this example, one period is five divisions, which gives a period time of five times 200 microseconds, and therefore one millisecond or a frequency of one kilohertz. The peak-to-peak -peak value for channel one is four divisions or two volt if we calculate it. And for channel two, there were two divisions and therefore one volt. And this also fits our previously defined signals. However, the mention scale is not fixed. The voltage axis can be changed by the vertical scale control knobs for each channel separately. And as you see, also the volts per division have changed accordingly. The time axis is common for both channels. It can be changed by the horizontal scale knob. Furthermore, there are offset control elements, again for both voltage and time. By using the vertical offset knobs, the ground reference for both channels can be shifted to our needs. The reference point is also displayed accordingly when having a look on the scope screen. In the same way, also the time delay of the recording can be specified by turning the horizontal offset knob accordingly. The delayed time is limited as the scope cannot capture an unlimited amount of data. In order to reset the different offsets to zero, you can simply push the offset control knobs on this scope. Another option that can be set for each channel is a so-called coupling. There are basically two selections available, which are DC and AC. For DC coupling, the signal is displayed as is, including signal offsets. For AC coupling, an additional high-pass filter with a corner frequency of about 10 Hz is added. This leads to an offset-free signal, as the offset is simply filtered as it has a frequency of 0 Hz. The coupling can be set by pushing the according channel button and selecting AC in the coupling menu. When changing the coupling to AC, you can see that the offset voltage is not visible anymore. Of course, the coupling mode can be set for both channels separately. A change in offset voltage does not lead to a change on a scope screen or to a different result. The coupling mode is also shown in the channel list on the right side of the scope screen. In this same menu, there are also other options available such as the possibility to invert the captured signal. Now we come to a very important topic, which is the so-called trigger of the scope. In the previous examples, we always had a stationary image on the screen. But we have to ask ourselves, why is this the case? How does the scope know when to start a new recording? This can be done by setting appropriate triggers. The recording is triggered when a defined event occurs. In general, there are many different types of events that can be fired depending on the channel signal. In this tutorial, we will focus on the simplest and most commonly used one. It's the edge type trigger event. As the name implies, the recording is triggered on a rising or falling edge of one of the channel signals. For simplification, we will now only concentrate on a rising edge event, on a single channel and use a ramp signal. The exact point is determined depending on the trigger voltage level that is shown in yellow. Have a look at the diagram. The trigger point is exactly at the point where the rising signal crosses the trigger level. It is marked with a red arrow. The second plot shows the single capture frames of the scope. Whenever a trigger event occurs, the signal is recorded for a specified amount of time. 
In this example, this time is set to 2 milliseconds. The third plot represents the scope screen with the superposed captured signal. You can see that for the same trigger event, the periodic signal is always drawn on the same position on the screen. This is essential to have a stationary image on the screen. Now let us try to reproduce this on the scope itself. Therefore, we have to have a look at the trigger settings. In the trigger menu, we select the edge type trigger on channel 1 and we would like to trigger on rising edges. You can see the ramp signal, the trigger level and the relative time. You see that the signal is triggered at the desired point, which is at 0 volt trigger level on a rising edge. Changing the trigger level also leads to a different starting point of the capture. The same is true when the signal itself is pushed up and down by its offset. However, if the trigger level does not cross the signal anymore, no static image is captured. But let us now get back to the original settings. After the trigger is set to our needs, a second signal can be added again. We see a stationary image for both signals even though the trigger is only defined for the rising edge of channel 1. This is due to the fact that both frequencies are the same and therefore also the capture of the second channel is a static image. However, when changing the frequency to a non-integer multiple of channel 1, we see that the second channel capture is not static anymore. This is due to the fact that the starting point of the second channel is always at a different position within the signal's period. Let us again have a look on the trigger animation. You can see that the trigger of the first channel remains the same. However, the second channel is always drawn on a different position on the scope screen. Therefore, the first channel produces a static and the second one a non-static image on the screen. Comparing our animation with the scope screen, we see that we get a similar result. However, for an integer multiple of frequency, the starting point of the captured signal is always the same in one period and therefore the image is static again. This tutorial has given a basic overview of the usage and the main functions of a scope, starting from a simple example over appropriate scaling to triggering. In the description, you will also find some more information on the signal generator and the scope we have used. These devices are the same that will also be available in our lab exercises at the Institute. We will discuss more advanced scope tools in one of our next videos. I'm Dominic with the Institute of Electronics. We hope you have learned something today. But anyway, thanks for watching.